where that's coming from and what the purpose is. If there's any landlords listening on today's webinar and you're asking your tenants for um, marketing plans for the next 12 months, uh, business plans, the last three years of P&Ls and uh, various other pieces of information like that would have to question uh, what the purpose of that is other than deferring or, or, um, or blocking the process and certainly not uh, the intention of the Code of Conduct and, and uh, the National Cabinet's uh, intention around uh, the process involved. So um, if we just go to the next uh, slide back, what I've put there is the in the mandatory code of conduct, there's a definitions page and uh, definition number two deals specifically with what is sufficient and accurate information. Um, and just the direct quote is this includes information generated from an accounting system and information provided to and or received from a financial institution that impacts the timeliness of the parties making decisions with regard to the financial stress caused as a direct result of COVID-19. Um, so our interpretation of that is essentially that uh, um, from the code of conduct, what we're measuring is the impact of the of the COVID-19 on turnover, uh, essentially turnover, um, especially during this initial pandemic period, the, the period of the JobKeeper program, which is what... Uh, these initial negotiations are, are specifically dealing with and most of the offers of rent relief from landlords are relating to this initial three to six months. Um, and in that respect, uh, really all we should be focusing on is the direct proportional impact uh, or impact of COVID-19 and then the proportional uh, rent relief related to that. So... Um, Certainly with our clients and our, our recommendations to our clients is that we focus purely on the turnover where we measure uh, the, the increase uh, or decrease of, uh, of turnover to a comparable month, um, same month last year is the easiest, of course. Uh, measure the impact as in uh, what percent it's decreased by and then relate that directly to uh, rent relief uh, of the same proportion. Um, obviously, when you're thinking uh, along those lines and keeping it nice and simple for uh, so that it meets that definition and that it is timely and can uh, lead to a quick agreement on, on the amount of uh, rent relief required to, to protect the business and to assist the business to uh, see through the period, um, then... Uh, then all those other things landlords are asking for really are um, uh, just uh, quite ridiculous, to be honest. Um, where we see those sorts of queries um, and expectations coming into play a little later, perhaps uh, in the recovery period where we're dealing more with uh, um, the impact of, of the COVID-19 over a longer recovery period, um, where uh, it's not not strictly related to turnover but to uh, profit impact or, or overall performance impact on the business. And at that point, we may need to show some other documentation uh, relating to the profitability uh, where things like gross margins are, are eroded because of the conditions post-COVID. Uh, and, and other factors. Um, plenty of businesses, particularly in uh, takeaway food and things like that, are impacted at the moment because many of their workers are not eligible for JobKeeper. They're having to fund uh, those employees, whether they're casuals that haven't been on for 12 months. Some, uh, Many businesses do employ students on international visas and things like that. So there's all sorts of uh, issues relating to the JobKeeper coming back after COVID, when you're not receiving JobKeeper payments for those people, uh, you may experience um, salary um, uh, salary issues that are detracting from your profitability. Um, so at that point, we may consider some of these re uh, requests for information from landlords to be more appropriate. But certainly at the moment, 
Um, what we expect is uh, just to focus on turnover only. And if you go to the next slide, Beck, um, to assist uh, retailers in that regard because of the volume of inquiries the NRA has received and certainly we've received from tenants on this specific uh, situation is we've developed a, a template letter that um, you, you can get from the NRA now. We've assisted in uh, the development of that, which simply responds to the landlord advising that their request for information sits outside of the code of conduct, refers to that definition and, uh, and essentially proposes what information might be provided. That's a good um, template as an as a initial response. Our, as tenant representatives, our response to landlords um, is a little more specific, a little more detailed than that. So that template would certainly need to be followed up with um, some more specific uh, information for each individual case. Um, the emphasis in all situations is acting in good faith and, and we don't believe that uh, some of the requests from the landlords uh, express that. Um, and certainly when we offer only the, uh, the information that we are prepared to offer, it needs to be presented in a way that expresses um, that that's being offered in good faith uh, and that there isn't anything else required to assess under uh, or in alignment with the code of conduct. Um, some examples of what, uh, what we, we believe meet that requirement is simply point of sale reports um, straight out of your point of sale software, which provides your gross sales for uh, each month. And uh, an often case, you can also include the number of transactions, which is a great way of indicating a drop off in foot traffic uh, if you're in a shopping centre and things like that, or any environment. Um, alternatively, we're happy to take reports straight from your uh, financial software, whether it's Zero or MyOB or some other. Uh, accounting software package that the sales from your register feed into, um, and 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 is there, there thereafter provided to your accountant um, for preparing BAS statements. So um, in in virtually no situations would we um, freely offer up BAS statements to a, a landlord. We don't feel that. Uh, the information on a BAS statement is in any way relevant. Um, there's only one figure on a BAS statement under G1, which gives um, total revenue, uh, but that doesn't show any specific month-to-month, uh, -month, comparable months um, decline in trade as such. So, uh, so we'll, we'll provide data before it becomes a BAS statement. Um, as a, at some point in the in the negotiation, and some point in in the reconciliation of any rent uh, assistance the landlords provided, it would be reasonable for them to expect to receive those sorts of uh, that sort of information verified by a, a, a licensed accountant. So um, usually at the end of the three month or six month the six month of the JobKeeper program, uh, it may be fair to uh, provide uh, statements from your accountant stating that each month's data that you've provided is uh, is true and accurate. Yeah, um, just go to the next slide back and I'll show a really basic form. Um, this is it's a, just a really basic spreadsheet. Uh, providing you an example of uh, what we might provide a landlord. Simply got the gross sales from the start of last year through to um, through to January to December, all of 2019 and all of 2020. It's got gross sales and transactions, and it's uh, and a column where we can calculate the impact of COVID-19 as a percentage, uh, and that will directly relate to the. Um, the amount of uh, rent relief that we're seeking from the landlord, uh, either month to month to month, month, or as a as an example of the uh, forecast um, impact over a period, which which would then later be reconciled. Um, obviously, they would want you to sign that as as um, true and accurate information, um, and we would see that as 
as really the the only document that uh, should be considered in the initial uh, rent negotiations. Um, so that's just a very quick overview. Uh, I think the main uh, benefit here will be to go to the Q&A and um, answer people's specific questions. Uh, um, and um, I'm sure there's quite a few. Becca, yeah, do you want to kick that off and see if there's some come through already on this matter? Absolutely. Let's kick it off. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah. We've got a question from Teresa. Under JobKeeper, you do not need to retest each month once you qualify. Do you need to retest monthly in order to request ongoing rent relief? Um, not, not to get approval. With JobKeeper, um, you, you apply, you get approved based on forward thinking um, um, forecasting of impact over the period. You do need to provide BAS statements for the JobKeeper to justify that at the end. Now, I've actually um, uh, queried this with somebody. Uh, uh, I have a colleague on the, on the Tax Practitioners Board and I asked this exact question uh, as to what would be the outcome if uh, at the end of the six-month period um, the BAS statements showed that a retailer was only 25% affected rather than 30%. Uh, um, knowing that 30% was the eligibility criteria. Um, she actually told me that there hasn't really been any thinking around uh, how to deal with that. Um, she believes there'll be a fair amount of flexibility, but um, but there's no uh, no procedure set in stone as to what will, what will happen to those tenants uh, who maybe over estimate the impact and then um, and then aren't impacted as badly but in terms of rent relief we're essentially uh, doing the same thing in many cases where um, where agreements are established over the whole six months based on some initial projections then there, there would need to be um, either supplying this spreadsheet that I've just shown you on a monthly basis to show um, how things are tracking and whether that impact is being felt on a month-to-month -month basis, um, whether uh, we just look at it at the end and there may need to be some reconciliation. And I use an example of um, outgoings. If, if anyone pays outgoings separately, you get a, an estimate of the, the year's outgoings at the start of the financial year or just before it. You pay that amount on a monthly basis and then that, uh, after that, period, you get a statement um, advising what was actually spent. And if you paid too much, they give you a refund. If you haven't paid enough, you pay them a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I would think that the, the best process going forward would be something very similar to that. That's the easiest and cleanest. But there are all sorts of different agreements being entered into um, loosely based on the code of conduct. So, um, uh, it, it's a good question. It's not a simple one-off answer. Thank you, Kyle. Um, Christy asks, if our landlord is asking for P&L statements, BAS statements, monthly management accounts for the period 1st of January to 30th of March, of which our rent is paid up and we are not asking for assistance in those months, are we obliged to give it to them? I give turnover figures every month anyway. Hopefully the, my first 10 minutes of the webinar answered that for you. <clears throat> um, the short answer is I don't believe you're obliged to provide any of that and I don't think the landlord is entitled to any of that. Um, the Code of Conduct doesn't anywhere uh, um, require that detail uh, in, in um, seeking rent relief and, and I think what I've just covered off in the first 10 minutes explains uh, what we believe is appropriate and reasonable and sufficient. Um, you provide the turnover figures anyway. They already have those. Um, it would be just presenting those figures on a simple spreadsheet like I've shown you today and uh, and advising that uh, that clearly shows the impact on your turnover, which is the impact on your business. Um, uh, we can only surmise that those sorts of figures that they're asking for with BAS statements, profit and loss and so on, is they're, they're 
they're more assessing uh, your your likelihood of um, surviving this and paying them back the deferred amount or or some other aspect like that. Um, it's either that or some landlords are just referring uh, or deferring to how they normally approach uh, requests for rental abatements. Now, under certain um, under normal circumstances, um, when a tenant requests rental abatements, it's usually because they can't afford rent. The landlord wants to understand why they can't afford rent um, and whether it's something that uh, they essentially are responsible for or whether the, the tenant um, needs to fix its own business. So uh, when they request that sort of information, they'll go through line by line on a PL, and uh, work out whether you're overstaffing your business, whether you're paying too much in salaries, whether you're taking cash out of the till, whether you're leasing flash cars, uh, all sorts of things other than um, the rent as a, as a uh, percentage of your turnover and, um, and want you to fix all of those things before they put their hand in their pocket. And to an extent, that's fair enough. Uh, but this situation is different. This is dealing with specifically um, the impact of COVID-19 on your turnover this month compared to the same month last year. Um, and you don't need P&Ls and everything like that to prove that. What, what we say to landlords requesting that is that your payment of rent um, for the lease period up till this point is proof enough that you're capable of meeting a lot lease obligations. Um, beyond that, all they need to know is the impact of, that COVID has had on your turnover. Lovely. Thank you, Kyle. We've got a question from Peter. We are in Victoria with a Westfield. They are yet to contact us in relation to the rent. Are they waiting for the government legislation or should we make an approach? We have been told by the retail manager that we will be contacted in due course. Yeah, I think um, it, it's up to you, Peter, to take the bull by the horns here. Um, it's your business, and you need to um, you need to make the approach to the landlord and specifically request the relief that is in line with the proportion uh, of impact you've received. Um, there's no reason to wait for Westfields to come to you. Um, no landlord is going to freely offer up, um, you know, waiving rent. Uh, and if you're waiting for them, all you're going to receive is, is the absolute minimum. So um, our suggestion would be to get in first and get in um, with your information, your spreadsheet showing the impact, um, your request for uh, waived rent rather than deferred and some information for them to base that decision on, um, what assumptions you've made as to the impact over the next few months, um, and also address the, the reasonable recovery period. So you need to start that dialogue with the landlord rather than waiting for them to come to you, whether it's Westfield or whether it's a mum and dad investor that owns owns the building. Um, get on the front foot and get it in quickly. Thanks, Carl. Um, our last question that we've got here is from Mark. Oh, we've just had another one come through. This is excellent. Um, we have a small number of locations where rent has been paid in advance. How do you suggest we approach landlords about applying the code in these situations? To date, they have been unresponsive to our request for relief. Okay, a couple of points there. One, one um, dealing with rent already paid in a period where you're seeking rent relief. Um, and in that respect, we've advised our clients uh, from pretty much from uh, mid-March to withhold rent based on the impact that they expect uh, on the business. Um, and that that's uh, brought up discussion about whether that's in good faith or not. Uh, we believe it is in good faith. Uh, it is in advance, not in arrears. So um, why... why pay rent in advance for uh, in this situation where you know that you're going to be impacted by COVID and there, and there should be reasonable relief provided by the landlord uh, under the code of conduct. So um, certainly going forward, don't pay rent um, uh, even if you apply the full rent that you've paid uh, to the next month. Um, 
uh, if you've paid 100% rent and you're 50% uh, impacted, then 50% of last month can go towards next month and uh, the landlord can work it out. Um, in, secondly, um, there was a second part at, at the end of that which I wanted to address. Um, can you just read the end of that? question back, sorry. Sure, Kyle. Um, So Mark said, how do you suggest we approach landlords about applying the code in these situations um, as they have been unresponsive so far? So unresponsive landlords are are proving, uh, oddly enough, um, I I don't know how they are getting away with being unresponsive. Um, you, You need to put something formally to the landlord uh, and advise that, um, you know, under the mandatory code of conduct, uh, you're acting in good faith and, and requesting discussion regarding your, your rent and relevant and proportionate relief to uh, for the benefit of both parties, not just your benefit. It is for the landlord's benefit as well later on. Um, and they need to understand that it's not, uh, it's not okay just to ignore these requests and uh, certainly if, uh, if you've formally um, contacted the landlord in that regard and, and you've followed that up as well and that, that's in writing and there's just a lack of response, uh, what we call unresponsive, uh, then there is a, a dispute process and, um, and it would be unfortunate to have to uh, advise that you were you would need to uh, start addressing it in that way. But there is a dispute process, uh, mediation process in place under the code, um, still somewhat being developed, but uh, but it is available and you can access that if needed. Um, but it's just not appropriate for landlords to stick their head in the sand and pretend that you're not contacting them for something that they're required to participate in uh, and is in their best interest to Absolutely right. Um, Question from John. An increasing number of economic forecasts for post-COVID are that the recovery will be slow and protracted, particularly for the retail sector. Do you agree that the anticipated slow recovery makes rental waiver more appropriate than rental deferrals? Yeah, absolutely, John. And we've talked about this for a number of weeks. Um, it's a real danger period, the the recovery period and the post-COVID period. Um, we've we've said in previous weeks, if you're on uh, then that um, deferred rent equals deferred pain um, and and very real risk to the business. Um, we've touched on the last week or two on uh, likely conditions post COVID. Um, we we certainly discuss the from an economic economic perspective and looking at past experiences. Uh, Economists talk about an L-shaped recovery. Um, These are conditions where there's a very steep decline initially and a very slow response uh, in the recovery phase. And um, that's the expected response on our economy. Um, uh, And we've touched on what that means for rents, what that means for likely turnover, um, tenants have to be protecting themselves now through negotiation with landlords in order to um, not just reopen doors at the end of um, restrictions on trade but survive the recovery period and and thrive post-COVID-19. Um, all sorts of things come into play in an L-shaped recovery. Um, we, we need to be looking 12 and 18 months ahead on uh, strategy around lease renewals, market rent reviews. Uh, We need to be pulling those forward where it's appropriate to. Um, They come into play with with any deferred rent because landlords are wanting to extend existing leases because they already see that existing leases are on far higher rents than what new leases will be in 12 months' time. And we don't want to lock into those sorts of situations. So it will be almost worthwhile considering and it's a strategic approach to consider um, not accepting deferred rent and only taking waived rent um, even if you give up some portion of 
of potential saving in the short term to protect your business long term, put you in a position where you're less likely to fail later on. Um, so it is a very good question, John. It's very detailed in terms of the economic outlook. Touched on last week with uh, how oil in prices, oil prices affect um, inflation. What's going to happen with CPI, and all those factors that that point this towards an L-shaped recovery that economists might talk about. Um, and, and in brief, we want to try to avoid deferred rent as much as possible um, in every situation. Lovely. Um, Stuart asks, from what date are landlords obliged to reduce rent in line with the code? Yeah, good question. And um, there's been some interesting stuff happen over the last week. Um, so the code generally refers to the, the JobKeeper program and it runs in line with the JobKeeper program. The JobKeeper program is identified by um, the pandemic period and it defines it very specifically as the payment period for JobKeeper, which is March 30 to September 27. Now, code of conduct is designed to run for a six-month period and to overlap that. Um, it, it, was, it came into effect on April 3, but again, it covers the JobKeeper program period, which is March 30. So um, the in good faith uh, um, take on all of that is, is it affects April rent through to September rent. Um, uh, or if the government um, ceases the JobKeeper program earlier. Let's say we find a vaccine next week and everything starts to return to normal much quicker and they uh, don't need to support um, uh, employees through JobKeeper for as long, then the pandemic period will cease earlier. But payment from April 1. Now, what's happened if you're in New South Wales is that the state legislation in New South Wales passed regulation last week giving effect. We're on the 24th of April, actually, day before Friday a week ago, day before Anzac Day, they passed legislation in New South Wales Parliament, which gave effect to the Code of Conduct. And that's what we want to happen. We want it to be legislated um, so that uh, landlords can't say they're waiting for the legislation to come into effect. In New South Wales, it is legislated, it is in effect, but they made a mistake and they, uh, they said that that legislation, that regulation uh, would commence on the day that it was published to the legislation website, which was April 24. So now we've experienced one landlord who is insisting on only paying rent relief from April 24th. That is absolutely not the intent of the legislation or the code. And uh, even that legislation in New South Wales, the regulation refers very specifically to the JobKeeper program. And that program, again, runs from March 30 to September 27. So um, if any landlord or anyone is telling you anything different other than the, the, the period that rent relief should be applied for is between April and September this year in the initial COVID period, then, um, then you need to have further discussion with them about that. Thank you, Kyle. Um, I've just got one more for you. Yeah. Uh, Teresa has asked, Australia has been successful in flattening the curve so far. If we are equally as successful in restarting the economy and sales are not adversely affected as much as we have anticipated, where do businesses stand with the JobKeeper program, particularly when businesses have paid out $1,500 to employees in advance? Yeah, I think um, look, the, the payment of JobKeeper is not really my area. Um, that's IR and HR and other very smart people that deal with all that side of it. But um, but I'll address the other part of that question about recovery. Um, don't be mistaken, the, the turnover does not return as soon as the doors reopen. Um, if we've, we have been very effective in flattening the curve, um, we are in good shape and we are on, on the way to recovery. Um, hopefully things will recover quickly, but um, every economic indicator is that uh, the L-shaped uh, recovery that I spoke about 
Uh, every indicator is this is a, sl a slow, long, um, deep and drawn out recovery for uh, the retail sector. Um, but then you look at individual retail categories within retail. Um, I have one client who um, relies heavily on the, the tourism sector, has stores in WA and, and in a, a tourist area in New South Wales. Um, their business will take uh, up to two years to recover because they sell a lot to Chinese tourism. So in mid-March, their business, the, the bottom fell out of their business when Chinese tourists uh, flights from China were, were um, prevented from landing or coming in uh, and they don't see uh, international tourism returning before February next year. So immediately uh, 70 to 90% of their business is, uh, is gone for that period. So um, uh, same with um, fast food casual dining in certain areas. Uh, uh, the DFO by the airport in Brisbane is um, is a case in point. Uh, relies heavily on airport traffic and airport travel. Uh, air travel is, is going to be deeply affected for a long period, particularly international. So those businesses will not return um, as quickly as some others. Uh, even businesses that do open their doors and, and, and achieve quite good sales in uh, fashion, for example, are sitting on a lot of um, stock which is already out of season. They're going to have to sell through at vastly reduced margins, uh, discounted, um, and that, that causes profit erosion. So those businesses might have top-line sales but um, be impacted in profitability. They're, they're every category of retail will be affected differently. Um, it depends on location. It depends on your, your target demographic. Um, but all of those categories will be affected. And when you overlay the uh, core economic factors around um, the uh, recession, which we are entering, uh, or recession-like conditions um, over the next 12 to 18 months, um, I hardly think uh, the first part of that question will be a factor, to be honest. Thank you, Kyle. Um, so that brings us to the end of this week's webinar. Um, we want to, again, thank you for the past six weeks where you've been sharing your expertise. And can you tell us a little bit about what to expect next week? Um, I'd love to. <laughs> I have no idea what to expect next week. Uh, every day, Things are coming up, and we're 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 hearing more. We're learning more. Um, what I have suggested as a topic for next week is um, reopening stores, uh, the impact on rent negotiations, um, particularly post COVID, which I've touched on today. Um, uh, updating monthly figures so that um, forecast becomes actual, uh, any adjustments you need to make in your agreements with landlords. Um, uh, try to keep focused on the leasing aspects of reopening and, and beginning trade again um, and definitely try to give some advice around um, getting towards the recovery period and, and what that impacts on what... Uh, what we really need to be focused on to get through that period and, and out the other side in the best possible shape. But if something occurs in the in the uh, in the world of legislation or uh, landlords' actions or whatever over the next week, we'll address whatever's topical. So um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. If All people right. have specific. Uh, um, you know, topics that they really want to have covered off that that hasn't been uh, a topic in the first six weeks, then um, send them through and, and we can consider those as well. Yes, um, if you have any questions at all about this webinar or anything that hasn't been covered, please feel free to send us an email. We're more than happy to have that discussion with you. Um, Kyle, thank you again and we'll see you same time next week. Yeah, thanks, Beck. Thanks, everyone, for joining and good luck this week.